for leading out for us in our music. That was so beautiful. Uh, thank you, Elder Will, for coordinating our program. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, for those of you who are joining us, welcome, welcome. Uh, those of you who are joining us uh, here at the Mountain View Central uh, for our divine service, I want to say a special welcome to some of my young adults that we were spending morning this morning, uh, diving in the Word of God, enjoying some good um, Bible study there. And and Fonny, good to see you and your kids. Um, I hope you had guys had a good Sabbath school lesson there. Uh, this morning. And of course, Lisa Ramirez, Ramirez we want to uh, just let you know that we keep you in our prayers and, um, and you and the family. I know you guys have been having some real challenging time for the last couple of months. But guess what? The Lord has brought you through and brought your family through all the time. So you have what to give God thanks and praise for. Good to see you, Fernando, and, um, in, and just celebrating God's goodness. Um, this morning. All right, um, I'd like to, um, since most of our time is already gone, I want to dive straight in the Word of God. <laughs> and, um, and for those of you who are not members of our church, but you're visiting with us this morning, we're happy to have you. Whether you're from France or you're from St. Louis, um, we welcome you. Uh, we are down in the south, southern part of the country in the coronavirus belt line. Uh, we welcome you, or you are in the middle of the country, we welcome you. If you're in the Caribbean, uh, we pray that the hurricane that is formed out in the Atlantic will um, disappear. Uh, we're keeping our eyes on that one. You know, that one normally heads our way into Florida. We're keeping our eyes on that one. Also, for the people down in Texas, we understand that you also will be having um, some, some tropical storm um, situation there um, and we just want to pray for you really don't want to deal with a hurricane in the midst of a pandemic um, boy that would be quite a lot on your plate um, but I hope you realize what's going on right around there are so many of the signs that are fulfilling uh, simultaneously this is the age of Eli this is the age of Elijah right um, the signs are just fulfilling one behind each other it's just so incredible um, and it just speak to the the authenticity authenticity of the Bible and that we can trust the word of God, that we can trust whatever God, if God says so, you can believe it because it's going to happen. All right, this morning I'd like to really take you back to, uh, I've had some fun preparing this. Uh, I don't want to call it a message, I want to call it a study with you this morning. For, the, for those of you who don't know, if you're just joining us, for the last three weeks we've been working the theme true worship and um, God knows we've got to go back there because worship has been giving a lot of trouble from Genesis all the way to Revelation right worship has been causing problem worship worship caused the life of Abel remember that the first person to die died over worship he and his brother went to worship. How do we know that? Well, they brought offering. That's where you bring your worship to, right? They brought offering. And one, you know, one came back alive, or one came back dead. One became a martyr, one became a murderer. Worship. Worship has been creating problems. Worship caused Shadrach and Meshach and, and Abednego to go in the fiery furnace. You remember that? They were required to bow down to this image and they decide under our dead bodies, we ain't doing that, right? <laughs> and it caused them to be thrown in the fire furnace. Worship is crazy, it's causing a problem. For a long, long time worship. And then, and then if you think the preacher is joking, just rush on down to Revelation. And when you reach the Revelation, you get a big caution down there, right? Huge caution says, hey, if any man worship the beast or his image and receive his mark, the shame shall be, um, thrown in the lake of fire, right, and be tormented with, um, with fire and brimstone forever and ever. So, so we, we, so worship is something we really have to take seriously. And I don't know that Christians nowadays are really taking see worship serious. People just seem to jump on any worship bagwagon that they find passing through. People just jump at any church. People just get themselves in and they just say, any worship is worship, any church is church. And it's a huge, huge, huge cataclysmic mistake. It's a huge mistake to get worship wrong. You get worship wrong, you lose your soul salvation. Let me say that one more time. 
If you get worship wrong, no matter how right you have been in any other thing, you're on your path, you're on your way to destruction, right? Um, so it is very important that we get worship right, right? So I'm going to take my time this morning. This is the last presentation on the subject, true worship. Bow your heads with me as we talk. Father, the moment has arrived again when we abandon our secular activities and we pay strict attention to your word. We have come to hear from you again. Speak to us through your written word and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For I ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. May I direct you to a passage of scripture we were chewing on last week and we didn't finish digest it. It's, it's in John, the John chapter four. And um, turn your Bibles over there. You, whether you have the Bible on iPod or wherever you have it, John chapter four. It's a conversation Jesus has been having with a low life in the society. John chapter four. And um, I'm in verse 19. Um, John chapter 4, verse 19. The famous story of the woman at the well. Jesus had a very interesting lunchtime date with her. This is strange. Strange will Jesus make dates with people we wouldn't even keep in our company, right? It's one of the low lives of Samaria, of the city of Sychar. Reputation is not too well. Um, not too famous, rather, rather infamous. She had this interesting discussion with Jesus. When nobody would talk to her, Jesus decided to have a conversation with her. We started that conversation last week, and for this week's study of the true worship, or the true worshiper, I want to ask you to take, uh, go with the verse 19. I'm going to pick up verse 19. I'm just going to eavesdrop the conversation. Matthew, I'm sorry, John chapter 4, verse 19. I want to pick it up there. The Bible says, Then the woman said to him, look at verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. That's after Jesus told the woman all her private story. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers, and she shift, shift the conversation from her story to worship. She said, our fathers worship in this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Now, last week we spent our time looking at that, and Jesus said to her, verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will uh, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. Jesus told her, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Then Jesus said this point in verse 23, but the hour is coming, comma, and now is, comma, when the true worshipers, and I underline those two words, true worshipers, and if that Bible is yours, Go ahead and underline it, because this is very important. The hour is coming, God told this woman, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And here's the next power part of the sentence coming. For the Father, for my Father, for my Father is seeking such to worship Him. Underline that statement if that Bible is yours. The Father is seeking such to worship him. Such what? The Father is seeking true worshipers to worship him. Hang on, because the first thing I'm going to cry out from this text, understand God is not looking for worship. No. What God is looking for is true worshipers. Mm-hmm. Hang on. God is not crazy over worship. No, 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 no. God is crazy over true worshipers. Now, hang on. If Jesus says the Father is seeking true worshipers, it presupposes that there are 
false worshipers. Are you still with me here? Okay. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and therefore, because there's, there's false worship and there is true worship, you and I must now get our head wrapped around what defines true worship. Because if we don't know what defines true worship, then we may find ourselves in false worship, worship falsely, and thinking that we're doing God a favor. Hang on. And this is what, this is the importance of our message this morning. Who are true worshipers? What is true worshiping? What does God define true worshiping? How do I know that my worship is true? That's our, that's our objective this morning. That's what we need to hammer out. So when you leave from this platform this morning, you must leave with certainty, right? That your worship is true. So what's true worship? The Father is seeking true worship. God is seeking true worship. How do I tell when a worship is true? Well, come with me. Here's what I want to, here's something I want to bring to your attention right away. I am, read my lips. God is too wise to leave man to decide for himself what worship is true. Oh, I love that. Let me, let me back up. Let me, let me back up. I'll come back slowly. God is too wise to leave us to decide what worship is true. Mm -hmm. Let me put it another way. God did not leave us to decide what worship is true. God did not leave a, 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 a committee of theologians to decide what worship is true. Hang on, I'm coming across. God did not leave the church to decide what worship is true. Hang on, let me come a little closer to you. God did not leave the pastor to decide what worship is true, or the conference president to decide what worship is true, or even the general conference president to decide what worship is true. God would be reckless to leave man to decide that. Uh -uh. God decide what worship is true all by himself. Yep. He decided all by himself because he alone knows what worship is true. So, so how do we then know that? Hang on, here, here's, here, here's the meat. God hammer out. God instituted four commandments. God instituted four principles, four laws that he puts in place for the exact specific purpose to, dis, to determine what true worship is. The first four commandments in your Bible, the first four commandments in your Bible were deliberately put in place by God to determine, to constitute true worship. So if you want a one-liner from the preacher, here's the one-liner. True worship True worship is constituted by the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments. Let me repeat that for you. Yeah. True worship is constituted, right? True worship is constituted by the first four commandments in the Ten Commandments. They were deliberately put there to protect, to design, and to protect, and to establish what God calls true worship. Right? They define true worship, right? They are the totality of true worship. So, so if you think the preacher is, is, is wrong, stay with me, let me prove this theory to you. All right? Um, how many people, watch me, watch me. I'm gonna prove this to you. One, first commandment says what? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Am I correct? Correct. Commandment number two, thou shalt not make any graven image and worship it. Am I correct? Correct. Commandment number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall worship and do all thy work, but the seventh day you shall not do any work. Four commandments. Four commandments. Come on, test, test this out for me. The moment 
the moment you violate commandment number one, thou shalt have no other God before me. The moment you have another God before God, can that be true worship? Come on top after the preacher. The moment you have another God before God, you no longer are in true worship. You're now in idolatry. As a church with me, come on. Number two, the moment you, you, you make graven image, uh -huh. and bow down to image, you're no longer in true worship, okay? Okay, number three, the moment you start to take the name of the Lord in vain, yeah? the moment you disrespect God's name, the moment you desecrate God's name, the moment God's name become irrever irreverent in your life and in your experience, you're no longer in true worship. Uh -huh. And guess what? Number four, the moment you decide to worship outside, decide you wor the moment you decide to come up with another day of worship, you're no longer in true worship. Mm -hmm. The first four commandments. Is, are designed by God to install and to protect true worship. Break any one of them and you're no longer in true worship. Have another God, you're no longer in true worship. Make image and worship it, you're no longer in true worship. And by the way, create your own day of worship and you're no longer in true worship. This is important for church members to understand. Take note a little further. God, true worship, if, if that is true, then I want to point something out to you. True worship is not defined by how many people in attendance. Notice that. Okay, so God is never impressed by big crowds. Ask Noah, he's only eight people saved down there. Where two or three are gathered, God's presence is near. True worship. So some people think, oh, I got to a big worship and it was so many people there. I mean, that does not define true worship. I understand that. Let me, let me work my way down. Yeah, yeah. Man, I went to this big thing and we had a good time and we have a wonderful time and I was blessed. The fact that you were blessed does not define true worship because different things bless different people. Am I coming across to you here? Don't use what, how you feel coming out of worship to define true worship. That's not a definition of true worship. Let me come on a little further. True worship is not defined by the place where you keep the worship service. We talked about that last week. It doesn't have to be in any temple right god says you will not worship in jerusalem neither this mountain the play the venue don't this divine decide um define true worship let me work my way down true worship doesn't define by the type of music that they use in worship service oh it was a beautiful worship service the music was good or no it was not good worship because the music was too loud true worship is not defined by the music that you put in the music in the worship service whether it's loud music or, or high beat music or so, so, uh, soft music, it's not, God, God is too wise to use that to define true worship. True worship is not defined whether you enjoy it or not, because the worship is not about you or I. Hello? True worship, none of those things are defined by true worship. True worship is defined when God lays down the regulations and the rules that governs it. When we abide by these four commandments, then you know you are within the ambit, the permitter of true worship. You shall have no other God before him. You shall not make any graven image. You must not disrespect his name. And he has established a day of worship. Those four commandments are your pillars on which true worship is established. If you're worshiping according to those guidelines, you can tell Israel that you are within the purview of true worship. So come with me. Since the last three weeks, I have been, I've spent working on the first three of those commandments. On this week, I'll now work on the fourth one, um, number four, commandment number four, the last of the four that defines true worship. This is a popular one for Adventists and, uh, and a troubling one for non-Adventists. This is a popular one for Adventists. By the way, for those people who are not Seventh-day Adventists, the only commandment that they hate is number four. Let me say that one more time. It's, a, it's an interesting stuff. For people who are not Adventists, the only commandment they hate is number four. Number four gives them a lot of problems. So I'm going to, and this is, and this is the fourth commandment that God used as a pillar to protect true worship. So come with me. Let's dig a little deeper into that. Um, here's it. Yeah. Number four, Exodus chapter 20. I know you know where it is to be found. But I'm boring you. Go back there, every one of you. Go back there. 
Uh, pretend like you don't know. Exodus chapter 20. Pretend, and by the way, those of you watching this, uh, this online, and um, you may watch the tape afterwards, uh, stay with me. Pretend like you don't know. Uh, I'm in Exodus. I'm in chapter 20. And I'm going to be reading from verse um, uh, 8. Uh, I'm having a problem finding Exodus. Yeah, here we go. Exodus. Exodus 20. We're going to read the commandment that people love to hate. Exodus 20. Take your time. Are you there? I'll wait until you're there. Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, get some thumbs up there. Good. So, for those of you who have read this commandment a million times before, forget that you have never, that you have never read it before. Approach it as if you're the first time you're going to see it. Okay? So, the, the, this is the fourth pillar of true worship. Here's it. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm in verse 8. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son, wherever he is today. Nor your daughter, wherever she is today. Nor your male servant, the helpers in your house. Or your female servant. Or your cattle. Or your stranger who is within your gate. Somebody comes to visit you. Flies to them. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and holiday. Okay, preacher. So you ask me, what's so interesting about this commandment? And my answer to you, it's in verse 11. Mm -hmm. What's in verse, oh, go back to verse 11. The interest is in verse 11. What is, God, what is God doing with this command? What is his objective with this commandment? Yeah? Why, why, does God, why, does, why does God want us to keep this commandment? What, 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 what relevancy it is? Verse 11 opens the key to us. Verse 11 says, For, come on, take your Bibles out, underline that word, that's a message there. For, 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 underline the word for, highlight it with a highlighter, underline it with a pen, do something with it because that's the crooks of chapter of, of, of commandment number four. God did not just say, keep the Sabbath day holy. Hang on, let me, let me, let me explain myself. When you go down to the rest of the commandment, it says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. There's no for behind them. Okay. Thou shalt not commit adultery. There's no four behind them. Look at those. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not be a four. There's no four behind them. God says, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Four. That word four implies a rationale for keeping the commandments. Okay? God, did not, God could have said, for I, God, say so. Or for I say so. No, 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 no. God gives us a reason he wants us to keep this commandment. And that's why it should, all our eyes should be open to this one, right? Yeah, he gives us a justification for keeping the commandment. A rationale for keeping the commandment. Don't keep it because your mama says you keep it. And sometimes I wonder, if I ask Adventists, why you guys keep the Sabbath holy? I wonder what they'll tell me. Oh, well, I keep it all because I was born and grew up in that church. I keep it all because I read it in the Bible. I keep it all because God says so. All of those may be good, but there's a wrong reason. You don't keep the commandment because, because your mama and your papa grew up and taught you to do that. You don't keep the commandment because, oh, I read it in my Bible. No, no, no. God gave a reason why he wants us to keep it. Four. Now, what's the reason why God says you must keep it? They, when, when they worship, he says, four, four in six days. If anybody asks you why we keep the commandment, give them verse 11. For in six days, God created heaven and earth. Hang on. So why is this relevant to keeping the commandments? Okay. One, please note, God says, I want when you keep the commandment, on the, when you keep the Sabbath day, I want you to remember every week when you keep the Sabbath day, I want you to remember who created planet earth. 
I want you to remember who put the stars in place? Who put the clouds in the sky? Who made the birds to sing? Who made the rivers and the mountains? I want you to remember which God is the creator God. Because if you can be reminded which God is the creator God, you can fall into idol worshiping. Your worship can't be misconstrued. Are you with me? I said, I want you to remember God created the heaven and earth in six days. And here's the next part. Here's the next part. In six days, God created the heaven and the earth. Notice this though. And he rested on the seventh day. Hello, somebody. The reason God wants us to rest on the Sabbath is because he himself rests on the Sabbath. Can somebody go home with that one? The reason we keep God's Sabbath is not because your mama tells you to do that. It's not because your papa tells you to do that. You're keeping, God says, I want you to keep Sabbath because I, God, kept the Sabbath. And since you are my child, I set the example and you follow. So when you keep God's Sabbath, you're following the example. You're following the custom. You're following in the footstep of God. Right? This is the rationale for doing it. So therefore, when you keep the Sabbath, you know you are on holy ground. You know your worship is true. You know you are solid because God says, I want you to do it not because some pastor tells you to do it or not because you read it in the Bible. No, I'm saying do it because I did it. Amen. Do it because I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so he took us back. He took us back because he says, but when in six days God created the heaven and the earth. And where is he taking us back to? Oh, for those of you who don't know, here's why it now makes sense. Genesis 2. Don't lose Exodus. We'll go back to Genesis. Genesis 2. If you're just joining us, true, we're talking about true worship. Genesis 2. Look at Genesis 2. Um, sorry, um, verse, verse Genesis 2. Verse 1. Then, then the heavens and the earth and all, the, and all the hosts of them were finished, says the Bible. Verse 2. And on the seventh day, God. On the seventh day, God. On the seventh day, God. Notice that. On the seventh day, God. God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day and uh, from all the work which he had done and god blessed the seventh day and god sanctified the seventh day because he rested from the work which he had done which he had made that is true that's the heart and soul of true worship so when people think you're crazy because you take Saturday off and gone to church, tell them I'm not crazy at all. It is, I, am, I am doing that which God requires for true worship. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me blow your mind a little bit. Are you ready for this? You're gonna take some oxygen in your brain. Um, uh, go back to Exodus chapter 20 verse. Go back to Exodus chapter 20. I told you, don't lose it. Go back to verse 11. 20 verse 11. Let me blow your brain a little. God created the seventh day Sabbath. Watch me. Verse 11, are you there? Back 20 verse 11. Okay, look at verse 11. It says, it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and holiday. Read the preacher's lips. God created the seventh day for one purpose, for worship. Ooh, let, one, one show. let me say that one more time. The reason God created the seventh day was for worship. Well, someone say, oh, but I thought it was rest. Uh-huh. It's a part of worship. Say, I say but, but where do you see that? I don't see where in my Bible it was created for worship. Oh, you don't see? It's right there. Look again. <laughs> Let me say that. Look again. It's right there. Where? In verse 11. I don't see it in verse 11. Yeah, it's right there. Let me, let me point it out to you. God created the Sabbath for worship. In other words, that is God's 
worship day. He created it for worship. Where is it, preacher? Verse 11. Show it to me. Oh, I'm happy. Let me show it to you. No, no, your eyes are in verse 11. Come with me. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Yeah. And he rested on the seventh day. Yeah. Still don't see the worship. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. Well, blessing is a little bit close to worship, but I still don't see it. Here's it coming out. And the Lord did something else. What is it? Come on, somebody remove your mic, unmute your mic and tell me. What else the Lord did with it? Hallowed it. Hallowed it. Hallowed it. What in the world does that mean? Hallowed it. That word hallowed it. That word hallowed it. Made it holy. Ha ha ha. So now, so now, 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 you, now I'm coming home. Holiness is associated with what? Anybody can tell me what is holiness associated with? God. God. It is associated, we worship God in the beauty of holiness. Holiness, holiness is associated with worship. Hey, holiness is associated with worship. We worship God in the beauty of holiness. When we come to worship, we come in a holy environment, in a holy atmosphere, right? And so, so when, when the Bible says that God not just blessed it, he could have stopped by blessing it, but he had to it. He not only blessed it, but he hollered it. He, he made it holy. It means it's a time for holiness. It's a time for worship. It is a time that God set apart from all other time to make it holy. Am I coming across to you? So then we know when God made the Sabbath day, it was purposefully done, intentionally done, deliberately done for one purpose only, and that is for rest and worship. So, so when it comes to Sabbath, it's God's day of worship. It's not man's day of worship. Man didn't make it. It's not your day of worship. You didn't make it. It's God's day of worship. And so, so if, you, if you line that up with the first four commandments, now you get the picture. God says, when it comes to worship, you should have no other God before me, because that's idolatry. You must not worship any graven image, because that's idolatry. Do not take my name in vain, and make sure that when you worship, you worship on the time and the day that I consecrated, that I desire that I put in place for holy worship. Now, if you worship outside of that, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. If you worship outside of that, you are on your own. No matter how sweet the worship was, read my lips, no matter how blessed you were, no matter how happy you were, no matter what happened there, all that comes to naught because it is false worship. It is outside of the four ambits of God's worship. No matter how you feel when you come out, no matter what experience you had there, it is predicated on false worship. Why? Because it did not come in line with the four points that Christ made. He set up four basic uh, laws that govern true worship. Don't have any God before me. Don't take my name in vain. Yeah? Don't worship any image. And remember, when it comes to worship, you do it on the day that I set up. That I set up. You, do, you break that, you're in the realm of false worship. Those are the guidelines for true worship. It was set up for worship. Can I prove it to you? Oh, let me prove it to you. Well, did, I, did I say that God created the Sabbath day for worship? Yeah, let me prove it to you. Now, I gave you one proof already in, 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 um, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. But let me, let me, let me prove another one. Uh, I'll give you another text to prove. Here's it. Here, here's it. I'm in Luke 4, verse 16. I'm in Luke 4, verse 16. Uh, look, this, this one will blow your mind away. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. God created the Sabbath for worship. It is his day of worship. That's why in Genesis, he started worshiping on the Sabbath day. Look at 4, verse 16. Turn your Bible, everybody Bible to over to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This is why, this is why you keep Sabbath. 4, verse 16. This is about Jesus, right? He was, he, the same God that kept Sabbath in, in, in Genesis, he's now on planet Earth in the form of Christ. Luke 4, verse 16. Are you there? Here's what the Bible says. So he came to Nazareth, 
same, same God, same Jesus, same God who gave the commandment, same God who rested in Genesis chapter 2. He's now in person on planet Earth. And the Bible says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Yeah, um, that's it. And he stood up for to read. This was God's custom. Question, how long has he gotten that custom? Answer, from Genesis and creation. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. How long does Jesus have this custom? Answer, from creation. So how come you have another custom? How come you worship another day when, you, when the God you worship has a different custom from you? False worship. Anytime your worship custom and your God's worship custom are out of line, you know you're in false worship. Because your worship custom must be in line with God's custom. <laughs> Together. And by the way, can I tell you something? It was not just Jesus' custom. It was Paul's custom too. Which Paul? The Apostle Paul. Are you kidding me? Didn't they say that Sabbath finished at the end of crucifixion? Well, come with me. It's like they're telling you. Come with me. I'm in Acts chapter 19. I'm in Acts chapter 19. Come over. Look over to the book of Acts. Anybody who tell you that Sabbath done away with after creation, that those are the devils from hell. Chapter 9, come with Acts chapter, Acts chapter, um, sorry, chapter 17, not 19, Acts chapter 17. We saw Jesus' custom a while ago. Look at the Apostle Paul. This is the land after Jesus is crucified and resurrected and gone back to heaven. Uh, look, uh, Acts chapter 17, it says, now, nah, I'm in verse 1. Now, now, are you there? Now when, Acts 17, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then Acts 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis uh, um, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 2, then Paul, ooh, look at the words coming up to this. Then Paul, as his custom was, almost identical to Luke 4, verse 16. Then Paul, as his custom was, went in unto them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Hello, somebody. The same custom Jesus had, Paul had it. And I am happy to tell you, I have the same custom too. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I have the same custom. How I many of you have the same custom? I have the same custom. I have the same custom that Paul had, the same custom that Jesus had. So I know I'm in good company, y'all. I know when I come to worship, people may not like it. Family members may not like it. People may call me crazy, but I'm in good company because I'm in the custom of the Apostle Paul. I'm in custom of Jesus Christ. I'm in, I'm in the custom that was established in the Garden of Eden. Hello, somebody. God designed the Sabbath for worship. Let me give you more. If you say, hey, well, is that really true? Yeah. Um, do, do you have any plainer text? Come on, let me help you. Is there any plainer text that tells me that Sabbath was made for worship? Is there any text that actually spell it out? Yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, where is it? I'm glad you asked. Come over to Isaiah. I'm over to Isaiah. What book did I say? Isaiah. Isaiah 66. Come over there. Uh, I just want to spell it out for you. Isaiah 66. And this one makes it so plain, right? You, you don't even need to go high school for this one. Isaiah 66, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. Last chapter of the book of Isaiah. Um, God created the Sabbath day for worship. Not just to sleep in your bed and rest. It is designed for worship. It's not just to walk in the park. It is designed for worship. Right? People always say, I've not seen that. Well, come, let me show you. Isaiah 66, verse 23. Look at verse 23. Verse 23, and tell me if you see it in your Bible. Here's it. And it shall come to pass, says Isaiah 6, 6, 23, from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to do. Shall all flesh come to do what? Come to worship. On which day? On Sabbath. God has created Sabbath for worship. Sabbath is not for us to sleep in our bed and say, oh, well, I don't go to work today. The Bible, didn't say, the Bible said rest. It didn't say worship. Hang on. It was designed for worship. That's why you need to get up out of your bed and worship God in spirit and the truth when it comes to Sabbath. It's designed for worship. That's true worship. True worship means we're honoring God on the day that he has set up. Yeah? It is single-handedly set up by God. 
It is, it is safeguard against false worship. But let me say this. If you worship God on the day that he sets up and you honor God by having no other God before, you can't get into idol worshiping because Sabbath worship vaccinates you from idol worshiping. Sabbath worshiping connects you to the creator. And I'm going to close by telling you one last thing. Um, I want to, oh, I have, I have two more things. Can I tell you two more things before I close? Is that all right? Yeah, and, and see, and just give me some thumbs up and, I'll, and I can tell you. Okay, some thumbs up. <laughs> oh, I see the thumbs up. Uh, two more things before I close, all right? Number one, number one, number one. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. Then you'll understand the point that the preacher is making. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. I, I, I almost closed that one and didn't tell you this, but since you, since you want me to tell you a little more. Ezekiel, Matthew, uh, sorry, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Lamentation, Ezekiel, right after there. Ezekiel 20 and verse 20. You said, I, you said I, wait, what was the other verse again? It was Ezekiel. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, verse what? For the 23, other one? 23, 23. Uh, okay. That was Isaiah 66, 23. Now go over to Ezekiel 20 and verse 20. Are you there? Tell me when you're there. Take your time. I'm going to show this nice one. Uh, um, this is critical. You, you, when, you, when you worship on Sabbath, you perhaps don't have a clue what you're doing. Here's it. Isaiah, um, Ezekiel 20, verse 20. Take your time out. It says, Hollow my Sabbath. Ooh, look at that. Made hollow my Sabbath. In other words, give it the respect that is due for holiness. Um, um, I'll read verse 19. I am Ezekiel 20, verse 19. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes. Keep my command, my judgments, and do them. Hollow my Sabbath, and they will be a sign huh, between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Hollow my, keep my Sabbath holy, and that will be a sign between me, and me God, and you man, that you man may know that I am the Lord your God. Now break that down for me, sister. Listen, hang on. If you're just, if, you, if, if you're sleeping, wake up down. God says, one of the reasons I'm giving you the Sabbath, Brother Fernando, God says, one of the reasons I'm giving you the Sabbath, Lisa Spolita, one of the reasons I'm giving you the Sabbath, the Curtis family, one of the reasons I'm giving you the Sabbath, God says, Christ is my rock. One of the reasons I'm giving you the Sabbath, and funny, is that you may know that I am the Lord your God. <laughs> Digest that for a little, re no, no, seriously, digest for that for a moment. One of the reasons God says, I am giving you the Sabbath to keep holy, so that you, it's a sign between me and you, a contract between me and you, an arrangement between me and you, so that you may know, in other words, by keeping God's Sabbath, you will know who is the true and living God. By keeping God's Sabbath, you will know that I am the creator. Now you understand why the devil from hell wants to get rid of that Sabbath. Now it makes sense. Now when you hear somebody say the Sabbath is done away with, you know that's an agent from the pits of hell. Now you know why people want to abolish it. Now you know why people want to cut it out the Bible. Because God says, I am putting it there so that you may know who I am. So if that is removed, we are lost. We don't know who God is. If you remove that, if you remove that, then we, are, we will use our own imagination. I think God is in the birds and the bees and the trees. We'll come up with all kind of crap as to who God is. Okay, right? We design our own God. You remove the Sabbath, we walk in darkness. God says, I am giving you this Sabbath. By the way, this is powerful stuff that you may know. I'm in verse 20. Just go up a little further to verse 12. Same chapter, same chapter, same book, verse 12. Look up, same chapter, same book, verse 12. Just go up to verse 12. 
So, and, and you get something more up there. Um, verse 12 of chapter 20. Same book, same chapter, verse 12. Here's what it says. Moreover, come on, look at it. Read this stuff with me. Moreover, moreover, it says in verse 12. Moreover what? Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be, here's it coming again, to be a sign between me and them, there are them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. I am their God. You can't go wrong. Let me say this. You can't go wrong when you keep God's Sabbath. You cannot go wrong when you keep God's Sabbath. And when you choose not to, you are wrong, bang, karam. Anytime you choose not to keep God's Sabbath, you know you are on unholy ground. You know you are in false worship. I don't care how big the church is. I don't care how sweet the music is. I don't care how lively the worship is. I don't care how blessed you were. It's false worship. 100% false. Because true worship comes in line with God's setup. God said, God didn't say I set up Monday that they may know that there's a sign. I didn't set up Sunday that they may know that this is a sign. I didn't set up Tuesday. No, no. I gave them my Sabbath, the seventh day, that they may know who the true and living God is. When you come to church on Sabbath morning, don't come out out here out of mere tradition. Come because you know that God has put that in place for you to connect with him. Well, I think I'm finished now. Oh, I have one more thing. Two things I said, I'll tell you. And that was one. I'm ready for the last one. By the way, have you noticed, have anybody noticed how the Ten Commandments actually begin? Everybody think it begins, thou shall have no other God before me. No, it didn't begin with there. You know, that, that's not how it begins. Anybody ever know it begins? I wonder if I test you guys. How does the Ten Commandments begin? Um, anybody know without looking? I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. That's how it begins. Verse 2. Look at it. Uh, prove it for myself. Exodus 20 verse 2. I am Jesus. God says, Moses, tell these people. Give them this commandment. Tell them, I am the Lord your God who have brought you out of the land of Egypt. Why is that important? Understand it. I want my people to know who I am. Because if they don't know who I am, they'll confuse me with the other gods. It will lead to idol worshiping. So I'm giving them the four first four commandments to establish so that they know I am the Lord your God. So now when you keep Sabbath holy, you're not doing it because your mama sent you to church. You're doing it because God <laughs> requires it of you. You're doing it because you're honoring God. You're doing it because you know that he's the true and living God. Do anything else and you are in idol worshiping. You're in false worshiping. So let me wrap this up by saying, so God said to the woman at the well, my father is seeking true worshipers. So if, if, oh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit downloading some stuff in my brain, um, and, and, and I have to share, I have to be, I have to be obedient to the Spirit. My father is seeking true worshipers. Line number one. Line number two. Who are true worshipers? True worshipers are worshipers who worship according to the first four commandments. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what my father is seeking are commandment keeping people. God is seeking worshipers who worship according to the first commandment. So God is not interested in the multiplicity of worship. Mega church and mega worship and mega stuff. And everybody, hey, that's don't impress God. Understand that. God is never impressed by crowd. Right? God has more angels than you could number who are worshiping day and night. Right? So our little crowd don't impress God. Don't let the crowd impress you. Say so that must be the truth. No, 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 no. God is impressed according to the standard of his word. It and hit alone. It says, I gave you my Sabbath that you may know. So I closed my Bible and I'm going to give you the last piece of information now. I was listening to, and this is amazing. I, I think I shared this with you guys before. Um, I was listening to a sermon um, from Andrew's Memorial Church, Dwight Nelson. powerful sermon and I did not notice this until he mentioned it in the sermon some years ago 
And when he mentioned it, I was blown away by it. Didn't I didn't I didn't take note of it. So I'm gonna share it with you right now. I'm gonna share it with you right now. He said, <clears throat> he said the Sabbath, yeah, the Sabbath comes on a weekly basis. Yeah. Time is divided. Time is divided into blocks. So we have a big block that is called a year. Yeah, 12 months. We have another block that is called a month. Okay. And then we have a block that is called a week. We have a smaller block that is called a day. And then we have hours and we have seconds and we have minutes. So come with me. Here's what he says. He says, have you noticed that all, most of these blocks of time are dictated by some solar movement, some, some movements of some planets. For example, it takes one, a year eh, is designed by one revolution of the earth around the sun. Am I correct? So when the, it, takes the, it takes the earth one year to go around the sun. That's how we get a year. So we get a year, one year around the sun. How do we get a month? Oh, a month, we use the moon, am I right? Takes the moon one month to circle the earth, okay? That's how we get a new moon every month and a full moon every month. So, so, so a moon, so God used the earth to determine a year, he used the moon to determine a month, okay? What does he use to determine a day, okay? A day is used by the earth spinning on its axis, am I right? 24 hours it takes to, to make one revolution on its axis. That's how we get a day, night and day. That's what they tell us. Right. Okay, good. So we get the, the earth moving around the sun gives us one year. The moon moving around the earth gives us one month. The earth spinning on its axis gives us one day. So what gives us one week? The Bible. What gives us God. one week? Huh. Where do we get one week from? And yet week is so critical in our structure of life. Yeah? There is no solar planet that gives us a week. Week is determined by the word of God. God himself. <laughs> God himself designed the week. Right? The God himself speak it into existence. He designed Amen. it. We get a week by the word of God. So whether the moon moves out of orbit or the sun star, the earth move out of orbit, the time, month and week can change, but the week remain because God designed it. Therefore, how do we get the Sabbath? It was designed by God. Ain't no moon give it to us, or ain't no sun give it to us, or ain't the earth give it to us. It was designed by the almighty God. And I said, bless the Lord. What an incredible piece of revelation. It is by God. That's why it cannot change. Right? That's why it cannot change. It is put in place by God. I gave them my Sabbath. Therefore, every week from one Sabbath to another, every week God expects true worshipers to come and worship him. Upon the authority of God's word, I can declare with without fear of contradiction that we had true worship today. Amen. I can declare the word of God. Why? Because we have chosen to worship God on the day that he instituted. We have chosen to worship God without any image. Look around. There's no image that we're bowing down to. There's no holy this and holy that and holy that. We're not bowing down and kissing any image or bowing down to any image or have anything in our worship. We complain and true to the feet of God. I can declare to you. We're not taking the name of the Lord God in vain. I can declare to you we had true worshipers. God is looking for such to worship him. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I would like, by God's grace, I hope it was a blessing to you. I'd like you to share this word with somebody out there. Tell them, God is seeking such to worship him. God is not impressed with your mega worship on some false day and some false stuff. He is seeking true worshipers those who will live according to his commandments. Yep, he seek, that's, that's the type of worship that pleases God. We may be few in number, 
but that's where two or three are gathered, God says, I'm there because that's true worship. Share it with your family members. Tell them why we worship you. Tell them why God wants us to worship. Bring them into Sabbath worshiping so that when the Lord comes, we all can make it home to glory. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I'm going to pray today. I wonder how many of you, as your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wonder how many of you, most of you are realized are members of our church, you understand this message, but you may have co-workers and friends, or you may have family members, you may have people that have not yet known the word, known, understood this, and you want to ask God to use you to share that word with them. Or perhaps you yourself may have been struggling with this. You want God to give you the wisdom and the enlightenment to share this with others and to confirm your own decision to follow the Lord in keeping Sabbath. If you have not yet been keeping the Sabbath, I trust by God's grace this would have helped you to order your, your, your life, to order your worship service in line with these four requirements set out by God's commandment. And for those of you who are family members and friends who have not yet kept the Sabbath, I pray that God will give you the wisdom and strength and the understanding to share this with them so that they can worship God in spirit and in truth. Father, thank you for the word today. Thank you for the revelation that comes to us with such clarity and such power. God, we now understand why you have put those commandments in place. They're designed to protect true worship. And now we understand why the devil would like to abolish the Sabbath, the, the Sabbath commandment, like to get it out, Lord, because he knows the damage that will occur. He knows that men and women will be lost. He knows, Lord, the world will be plunged in idol worshiping. But thank you. Thank you that you put in the word, remember, so that today, Though we may be small in number all across this planet, there are those who remember that word and are worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I seek your blessing on all who bow their head today. Give them the wisdom, give them the understanding, give them the clarity so that they can share this word with others. So that when you come, family members and friends and co-workers will be saved in your everlasting kingdom. For this we pray and ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. God bless you. We hope it was a blessing to you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise.